Well, first of all, uh, again, greetings wherever you are joining from. Um, and uh, some of you may have impacted with uh, Hurricane Helene. And, you know, that is, I am in the East Coast, South Carolina. So um, sending uh, well wishes to all of you for your good recovery. And also, I want to welcome all of you to USDA NIFA uh, 1890 Capacity Building Program um, Panel Orientation. I just want to confirm, is the recording on? Yes, the recording is done. Wonderful. Thank you. So this is a fiscal year 2024-1890 Capacity Building Grants Panel Orientation. It's a pre-panel orientation. And my name is Rizan Amaru. I am actually uh, leading this program along with David Wagner. Uh, we are in the USDA NIFA program side and we are managing this portfolio. Alongside, I'm also managing uh, the 1890 facilities program and some other programs as need comes in. So I just want to start with some of the meeting logistics. Um, this session is being recorded. So um, if you, I, I'm not sure you have the capability of unmute and speak because this is a webinar, but if uh, otherwise, please keep muted and minimize the chat box. And again, since it's a webinar, the chat box may not work, but we uh, as host, we'll be able to communicate to you. But there is a, Q&A session and there's a Q&A box. So please uh, submit your questions through that uh, Q&A box. And if you have, if you're experiencing any, uh, tech, you know, uh, Zoom issues, technical issues, please contact this number and go through the option two. Uh, we will share this recorded webinar once it is being cleared through our communication office. And uh, if it is, somebody who will not be able to attend also be able to uh, listen to this uh, webinar. Just I want to cover the topics we are going to uh, go over today. I'll give a brief introduction to the staff and all the other uh, personnel involved in this panel. And then I'll go over, uh, actually hand it over to David Sosa who would cover the financial logistics and then I'll uh, take it back to cover the areas of uh, program about the 1890 capacity building program, the purpose, the goals, and the priorities, just to introduce you to this uh, as you know, uh, this program. And then uh, the guidelines for NIFA review process, the evaluation process, and then talk a little bit about the panel discussion, guidelines, and ensuring impartiality in panel functions. And then we will conclude after our Q&A session. Now, again, this is a 2024-1890 Capacity Building Grants Program. We have two different panels and the NIFA team comprised uh, actually me, myself, and David Wagner, who is the program specialist, and David Sosa, who is the program assistant. And I'm just going to... Uh, ask them to unmute and come and introduce themselves from NIFA team. Hi, everybody. Uh, like Rosanna said, I am David Wagner, the program specialist. I work on the 1890 capacity building program here, as well as the facilities program. I will be your point of contact throughout for all things PRS before and during panel. Thank you, David. So, so. Well, thank you, Rosanna. David Sosa, and I look forward to uh, providing information uh, with you and being in touch with you regarding your honorarium, and uh, I'll have more details on that upcoming. Thank you. Thank you, David Sosa. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panel manager, Dr. Jeff Jacobson. Um, Jeff, would you please introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, Jeff Jacobson. Here in uh, sunny, hot Arizona, I was retired fully uh, until Rosanna uh, called me and asked me to participate with her and her team as a panel manager for the uh, capacity building programs for the 1890s. So I appreciate 
each and every one of you participating with us and really a, in a deep dive into the programmatic efforts across teaching, extension, and research with the 1890 land grant institutions. Look forward to working with you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's it's a it's a huge, uh, high volume program, and it's a really good program. So all your work, I appreciate at this point uh, on behalf of NIFA. And then I also want to all the panel members. There are two panel uh, members who are participating here together: the research panelist, education, teaching, and extension panelist. I uh, really welcome you and uh, looking forward to working with you, with our team. And I hope you also find this experience very rewarding for you. Um, and then I just going to move on and switch gears and uh, yield to David Sosa, who is going to cover about the financial logistics. Thank you very much, Razan. I appreciate it. I wanna thank all of you that are attending. I saw a lot of familiar names and some new names. Uh, so it's uh, going to be a pleasure working with you again and uh, also an opportunity uh, to work with uh, new panelists uh, in this process. Uh, this is the honorarium payment uh, processing information, and I'll have some uh, details about that as we go on to the next slide. Okay, uh, these are basically explaining uh, the qualifying recipients, uh, U.S. citizens, uh, legal permanent resident. Uh, if uh, you do have a H-1B visa or something similar, uh, we ask that you do check with your human resources office. Uh, we need to then go into a little more detail about that, whether there's any eligible, eligibility in that aspect. Uh, the honorarium payment is uh, $265 uh, per panel day. Uh, we know that uh, the agency recognizes this process does uh, take time from your schedule, it takes more than five minutes to complete uh, these proposals. So this is a, a token of appreciation, a recognition uh, for uh, that duty and service. Uh, I always say that if we have any federal government uh, panelists, uh, the agency gives you a deep heartfelt thank you uh, in lieu of a payment, uh, since we cannot provide you with one, uh, as these uh, honorariums are for non-federal uh, uh, panelists. The uh, payments are electronic fund transfers. Uh, we used to provide paper checks back in, especially back when we were had on-site panels, uh, but those paper checks uh, do uh, have a cost to them and we actually would send them priority mail if we did not have those ready uh, for those on-site panels or if they were virtual to uh, send those, there is a cost to that and the uh, EFTs uh, do not uh, procure that cost. I'll go into a little bit more detail about how that uh, collection uh, for your banking information uh, occurs because the agency also recognizes uh, the security concerns about that. And uh, and then just a, the note at the bottom, uh, to the honorarium payment would need to go directly to the panelists yourself. Uh, due to agency policy, we cannot have uh, honorariums uh, deposited to the university or institution or entity that you work with. Uh, as it needs to reflect the panelist uh, and match up uh, so that payment uh, can be processed. Uh, next. The uh, automated clearinghouse form and uh, the W-9 form are two forms that I'll be sending you by email. The uh, ACH form basically would uh, require your uh, banking account information, whether it's checking or savings, and that would be the information that would be entered in this in our system, uh, so that at the conclusion of the panel, uh, the payment can be uh, deposited to you. Uh, that will not require a signature, although it uh, has a section for it. Uh, there's no need for that, but I'll have that uh, explained in the email I send you. The W nine form. It's an IRS form. 
uh, that would require your name, home address, uh, social security, and signature that will need a signature. Now these two forms uh, will, uh, when I provide them to you, there will be a, a link uh, to a platform that NIFA has used called Box, B-O-X, and it's a secure platform uh, for the collection of documents. Now, this system was implemented about a year and a half ago, and there have been multiple panels that we've used this with, and it's worked very well. And uh, I will let you know by email once I receive your form that you've uploaded it for your awareness that it did uh, reach the folder in the uh, box system. They're both PDF forms, and uh, I'll have that link in the email. Once again, just explaining that the box system is a secure platform and it's essential uh, for our agency as we're not accepting paper forms, uh, especially nothing by mail as there's no uh, mailing address provided and it's not recommended, uh, of course, to uh, have such sensitive information there. So this secure platform is the uh, best option. Uh, next. Okay, as I mentioned, the ACH and W-9 forms uh, that I'll be sending you, and I'll have more information there along with the link. The uh, panel survey link is an uh, email that I will send to you at, after the conclusion of the panel, and it's optional, uh, but it's very important for our program team uh, to know your thoughts, your experience on the panel, uh, if you, especially if you have recommendations on any improvements. And of course, any positive uh, comments are welcome, but we especially welcome any critiques uh, that you've noticed that can help uh, the program. One option that is very important is that you can submit it anonymous. So that's a very welcome feature as you can then uh, feel comfortable in providing uh, criticism or any comments that, of course, not inflammatory, but something that would improve uh, that may not uh, uh, have been done during the panel. So that anonymous uh, selection is very important uh, and it's uh, for your benefit. Next. Okay, my contact information again uh, listed there, but that'll be in my email uh, that I sent to you. Now, the honorarium after the conclusion of the panel, I will submit a request for forms for each of you that qualify for the honorarium. We put in 45 to 60 days, but they should deposit before then. We do want to give it some time. Sometimes uh, it depends on uh, our budget office and how many panels are processing to eventually get to ours so that uh, your payment can be made. Of course, after that, it goes through your banks. That takes some time also. Uh, so please uh, have some patience uh, with us. Now, I uh, wanted to mention another thing. The agency has implemented uh, a panel training that takes effect yesterday or took effect yesterday. And this training is a requirement but the material is not available at this time. So I'm not, I cannot tell you 100% uh, if you would be taking this, but I do wanna make you aware of it in case it comes from left field, all of a sudden you'll have an idea of what we're talking about. And uh, it does take uh, some, it, depending on, the, on, on your pace and scheduling, uh, maybe up to three hours to do that. So the agency, recognizing again that uh, you do have schedules and, uh, and such, we'll be providing a one day uh, panel honorarium amount of 265 apart from your days of service for taking that training. But uh, we'll have more information on that. It may come from one of the uh, program team members or myself uh, for, for, for you to complete that if it, uh, is brought up and that material is readily available. Uh, next. All right, and so I just wanted to confirm that was my last uh, part of the section. 
like I said, I'll have a lot of information on my emails to you along with the link. I expect to send that to you this week, if not early next week. But uh, I look forward to uh, working with you and uh, I'll be here through the conclusion of this uh, presentation uh, in case any questions come up and I'll take a look at the chats. But uh, if you do have any questions, of course, you'll have my email to uh, send those to me when you receive it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave, so, so much appreciated your coming in and explaining this uh, financial logistics to our panelists. Uh, since you brought up about the training, I just want to give a brief update about it before moving into the rest of the webinar. Since this panel is basically in a halfway through where the training requirement came a mandate, uh, currently this panel is being exempt for that training requirement. Uh, it's currently, that is the information I have. Uh, and you are not required. It, uh, and if there are any changes happening uh, towards that kind of a requirement, uh, we will let you know as soon as possible. With that, uh, I am switching gears again to talk to you a little bit about the 1890 Capacity Building Program. Uh, this program area, the goals and priorities uh, uh, to introduce you. And I know some of you are returning panelists who are well aware of this program. Some of you may be a very uh, first time serving in this program. So it is good to, for us to introduce you to the program to give you some um, background. I just want to give you the three major goals of this program. Um, this program is mainly focusing on advancing the cultural diversity in the food and agriculture sciences by training young uh, underrepresented group. Uh, they may be able to represent the workforce in the future. So it's also strengthened the linkages among 1890 institutions. And some of you may wonder what is an 1890 institution versus uh, the 1860. I will show you a graph of that later slide. The linkages among 1890 institutions with other 1860 institutions or tribal colleges and technical colleges. Of course, the federal entities like USDA agencies uh, apart from NIFA as well as the private industries. The third objective is to enhance this and strengthen the quality of teaching, education, extension, and research program at 1890 institutions. Therefore, they will be also a full partner in contributing to the US food and agriculture science higher education system. Now, the RFA for 2024 is available in our website, and also uh, they will share the link to the RFA so you can actually download a copy of it. In the invitation letter I sent out, I also attached a copy of the RFA. Now, these are the eligible institutions. There are 19 of the 1890 institutions. You could see that they are mostly concentrated in the southeast region, and some of them are a little bit in southwest and also east. And uh, except Alabama, which has two different institutions, Tuskegee and Alabama A&M University, the rest of the states have only one institution. Now, the priority area for this uh, CBG program is very diverse. We have 12 listed priority areas here. And when you join the panel, you may be able to see that the panelist comes from all walks of life, different expertise. They may represent in nutrition or sustainable agriculture, agronomy, food security, climate, smart agriculture, workforce development, uh, food safety or even positive youth development. It's a very diverse panel uh, actually covering many different priority areas and the applications looks very uh, diverse as well. Having said that, the priority areas are only not confined to this 12. If there is a national need or if there is a regional need, then the applicant application may also 
uh, come from such kind of uh, covering for such kind of need. For example, if there is a bird flu like which we are experiencing recently, and if an applicant is uh, proposing to do some work with bird flu, and it's not uh, pretty much here, the animal science is not covered, but uh, we do consider that because it's kind of like a national need or regional need. Now, when you read the RFA, you may come with these interchangeable uh, terms of grant types or project types. So I will take a couple of slides to explain to you what are these grant types and what are these project types. There are three different grant types. There's a standard grant, collaborative grant, and professional development grant. Now, what is a standard grant? A standard grant is basically an individual institution, just one 1890 institution going to apply on behalf of its own. So there may be one PD or maybe some of the collaborators from the same institution with a single subject or discipline, they will be applying to request money. On the other hand, the collaborative grants are bringing in partners. It may be two or more institutions, uh, partners coming into play. It's creating a critical mass of expertise to generate the knowledge and uh, technology. So it could be interdisciplinary or it could be multidisciplinary. However, please uh, do remember that these kind of applications, the post institution, which is the 1890 institution, should not transfer more than 50% of their awarded funds to the partnering entities. The professional development grants are very different from the, uh, the two I explained before. The standard grant and collaborative grants are mainly focusing on building capacity to the institution, while the professional development grant only focusing on the uh, individual who is applying and to build the capacity or the professional development in the area of teaching, education, extension, or research for that particular professional, it's like a faculty member. So uh, when I discuss about the evaluation criteria, there are differences in how you are going to evaluate uh, standard grants and collaborative grants as opposed to professional development grants. Now, project types, which are basically a different uh, term which uh, you may uh, encounter in the RFA. Project types are teaching education types or research extension. And I'll come back to the integrated later. Now, each of those uh, project types has different grant types. You could see that standard collaborative or professional development and their own way of the highest funding amount or the ceiling. In addition to that, any of these project types may include an artificial intelligence or machine learning component. If they did, they also are eligible to request up to 150,000 on top of this ceiling amount. Now, integrated grants are slightly different. Integrated grants are either the they are bringing in two or the three of the project types. For example, it may be teaching and extension or extension and research or all three of them. And we do not have a dedicated discipline code for a uh, program code for this integrated uh, project, but the applicant may have used the primary project type. For example, how do you determine the primary project? About two thirds of the budget is allocated to research, one third allocated to teaching, then that particular project may be integrated project is uh, a research project. And this is why some of the panelists may end up in research, even though they have a teaching background or vice versa. There are three different application types. There are new applications, there are resubmitted ones and renewal applications. For resubmitted applications, it must include the response to the previously uh, given panel summary, the response to that review panel. For review applications, applicant may interested in continuing the work, so they might uh, able to come up with some more uh, additional ideas to continue and submit a proposal. 
So the progress report of the previous funded uh, uh, pro previously funded project must be included alongside the data management plan. Let me talk a little bit about the NIFA review process. The review process goal is uh, in order to fund, we wanted to use this merit review system. So merit review system is the one we will be using to rank proposal and uh, make decisions on funding. The evaluation system is, since we are using this system of ranking proposals using the merit, it should be very fair and unbiased. There should be accountability. The review process should be respectful and confidential. And any criteria used to review an application must be those published in the RFP. I'm going to talk a little bit about the confidentiality. And uh, during that invitation email I sent out, I also had a, a attachment which shows the COI form. I uh, kindly request you to fill out those forms, scan it and send it back to me and Dave Wagner. Uh, so we can have those uh, information collected to get the necessary clearance from our end. Please do not discuss any details of these proposals applicants or what was discussed during the panel process. Do not reveal your identity of any panelist uh, or their participation in the panel. You may just mention that you are participating in a different panel, but do not give the identity of the panel or even the identity of any other participants. At the end of your process, all electronic and printed materials must be deleted shredded or returned at the conclusion of the panel, including any notes you have taken, written down information, please destroy them. All notifications to applicants regarding the funding status or funding decision will be done by NIFA staff. And uh, this will be done after approval of the panel recommendation. And please do not communicate any information to the applicants uh, directly. The second most important part of this panel process is review process is the conflict of interest. Now you have conflict of interest and you must disqualify yourself as a reviewer of an application. If you find one of these six criteria, which I'll explain with the uh, follow, uh, with the project director or any other key personnel listed in the application. We have taken careful measures to avoid any applications which are given to uh, you know, panelists who might have any conflict of interest. But however, some of those are um, may not be evident. So please uh, divulge us if you see any conflict of interest uh, in the very beginning of the process. So what are the conflict of interest? If you are working from the same institution or had a previous employment with that institution in the past one year or 12 months, or even being considered for a future employment, that creates a COI. If you have been a co-author of a publication with that applicant with the past three years, or you have a including, uh, you have a pending publication then it also creates a conflict of interest. If you are a collaborator on a project, as a, like a partner, or uh, it has been in the past three years, or so anything you wrote recently, a proposal which are pending or planned collaborations, please exclude yourself. If you were a thesis or postdoctoral advisor or advising, uh, both ways it goes around, so that also creates a conflict of interest. If you have ever received a consulting fee or any financial arrangements or any type of uh, compensation like money, goods or services from that applicant or any other key personnel, that also creates a conflict of interest. And lastly, 
if you have a relationship like as a parent, spouse, child, sibling, um, a very close friend, those are also categorized as conflict of interest. And if you have any questions regarding your conflict of interest, and if you are doubtful about it, please do contact us and we can actually look into that. So please take a quick look at all the assigned proposals. I am sure you, all of you have a PRS access now. And make sure the first thing is whether you have any COI. If you uh, do not have any COI, please go ahead and review them. But if you do have, please let us know so we may be able, able to make uh, rearrangements. Sometimes uh, COI uh, during the panel process, if there is, uh, you don't have a proposal which are assigned to you, but you, it was like your institution you are working or some other COI. During the panel process, what we do is we uh, have um, breakout rooms and during the discussion of that proposal or application, we will send the uh, panelists to the breakout room uh, if they have some sort of a COI. The review process are three points. There's pre-panel activities, panel activities, and the third one is the post-panel activity. Now we are in the pre-panel activity. Uh, so you are all assigned with proposals, so you could go ahead and review the proposals now, conduct individual review for each of those proposals and upload your review comments into PRS. And I'll go over a little bit of the details of that. And then we will hold the panels. And during the panel, the proposal, each and every app, uh, app, you know application will be discussed and we will develop a panel summary in PRS for uh, any proposals except for the ones which are triaged. And then we have the post panel activities, which is all uh, in the hands of uh, NIFA and will process that and inform the applicant. I do want to remind all of you, all the pre-panel activities must be completed by November the 8th. So if there are any reviews due, please upload them on or before November the 8th. That gives sufficient time for us, uh, NIFA staff, to go over individual review to make sure that they are ready for the panel. And you may wonder that we have like about 167 uh, applications from both panels, if I may have numbers a little bit here and there, and uh, three reviews of each. So we have a lot to read. So I appreciate if you'll be able to submit all your uh, reviews by November the 8th. Let me talk a little bit about the evaluation process. Now, the first evaluation process is described in RFA, uh, pages 34 and 37. And it is actually a two-part process. When the application received, the NIFA staff did the screening of this, uh, all the applications to make sure that they are meeting the RFA's administrative requirements. And any application which qualified to move to the next level are now actually forwarded to the scientific peer review process. This process will technically evaluate the application. So each application is evaluated by three peer reviewers and a reader. Once the peer review panel is completed its deliberation, the program staff of NIFA will recommend any projects that is approved for support from currently available funds. It is declined due to insufficient funds or it was declined due to unfavorable review. The evaluation criteria again, uh, in the, clearly described in the RFA, and I just want to uh, emphasize that here, the evaluation criteria for standard and collaborative grants are different from the professional development grant. The standard and collaborative grants are mainly focusing on building capacity to the institution. So it must be uh, evaluated based on the potential for building and strengthening capacity and advancing the quality of teaching, education, extension, and research. 
So when evaluating this uh, application, look into overall approaches. Is the idea innovative? Is the hypothesis valid? Is the methodology well described? Are the experimental designs are explained? And also look into the uh, partnering entities. Are there any cooperative linkages which may bring into critical mass of knowledge and skill to this institution? Is the overall quality of the proposal is good? And then also it must be looked into the personal resources. Is the PD, four PDs are qualified to do the research. research. Do they have enough resources and facilities to conduct this uh, proposed idea of research? And also look into the budget, whether it is beyond the ceiling, whether it's reasonable and whether there are cost saving uh, measures are actually indicated. When it comes to professional development grants, these are again, mainly uh, focusing on the merit of the individual who is applying, the faculty member. So it should be evaluated in the means of enhancing the capabilities and competitiveness of the applicant, not for the institution. While looking for that, look into the merit, ex uh, ap merit experience of the applicant and also whether the proposed idea sort of a, maybe a training or a going into a federal lab or working with a private partner, getting some sort of a, a new technology which can enhance, which is relevant to that 1890 institution, or is it relevant to the US agriculture? And also, again, we have to be mindful about the appropriateness and the cost effectiveness of the proposed budget. These are the evaluation criteria which are listed. In addition to that, there are a lot of different information which are required for an application which might say it is required or uh, essential, such as, for example, a data management plan, a mentoring plan, an outcome, a research outcome table. So please keep uh, those criteria as well in evaluating your uh, application, especially look into the data management plan if there is a teaching and education, uh, then mainly look into that mentoring plan as well as the uh, outcome of the project in a well-described manner. So each and, applic uh, each and every application need a written review. So your review is actually sent to the applicant and they, you know, verbatim. We don't make any changes unless otherwise there are any rough languages that we need to remove that. Applicants read your review with great enthusiasm and interest. An overall ranking, just giving a ranking without a clear explanation is really meaningless to the applicant. If a proposal is ranked as a poor or fair and no explanation give, given, that would not make sense to the applicant. Of course, applicants will push back. When there is no satisfactory justification given to their proposal ranking, they really do push back. So please remember that what it is like when you are on the receiving end of a critique. I'm sure many of you are here coming from the university and have submitted many proposals and you are enthusiastically waiting for the decision. So uh, fill into that shoes and think about that, how you might feel if you uh, receive that kind of a criticism. So please be objective and constructive. Uh, that would help the application applicant to improve if to fund it or if not in the future. Sarcasm or derog derogatory comments are not welcome. So how to develop a written review? This process is more or less like reviewing a manuscript for a peer review journal. And I am sure that all of you have done that many, many times. So please set aside a time to review this each, uh, proposal about four hours for each proposal. And you may also need additionally one or two hours to produce the written review. 
structure your review using the strengths and weaknesses. I'll give you a framework in the later slide. And uh, please draft your review comments on a word processor. Perform the spell check and grammar check. Uh, also avoid using any special characters because when you try to copy and paste these special characters to PRS, PRS do, uh, does not digest it very well. So you may see some uh, weird characters popping up there. So just don't use any special characters, uh, just a regular word processor and then copy, you could copy and paste them. And also please remember that do not include your name or any score in the body of the review. So proofread your review for the following. These are the categories we are kind of recommending. Contraindicated. That means this proposal should, should be funded or funding recommendations. Do not include uh, any of the wording like that. The reviewer's name or any personal identifying information uh, should be eliminated. Uh, if the proposal is not well written, suggesting a resubmission. Do not uh, include such phrases there. And also use of review score as a descriptor. If there are any inappropriate content, like reference to a national origin, scores or rankings, rough languages, or any uh, unconscious or conscious bias statements. The formatting also, uh, as I recommended, to use a uh, Microsoft Word or Word processor to do a typing and spell check and grammar check, avoid any bullets, hard returns, italicizing it, underlining or symbols. And any redundant information such as like the title of the proposal or the proposal number are not necessary. As a reminder again, please do not include your name or score in the body of the review. This is just like a framework of a structure, how you can work on your uh, review. There is a scientific merit. Uh, you want to look at it and whether there's innovation, hypothesis, approach, everything is uh, really good with strengths or weaknesses. Look into the qualification of the PD and co-PDs, the facilities and how they are proposing the project management evaluating the projects over the time, the strengths and weaknesses. Strengths and weaknesses of the project relevance to the 1890 institution or the US agriculture, the, the, the priority areas which we were uh, showing the listed. The overall strength and weaknesses and also look into the budget and the appropriateness of the budget. Essential elements of an individual review. That's a written evaluation of each review criterion is important and also an overall project or summary of your evaluation is good. So you could go ahead and talk a little bit about individual component and then final uh, paragraph as a summary of your overall evaluation. Then the PRS also will show you a merit score a card where you'll be able to do a score, which like excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. This is separate from your review, uh, written review, and you just have to actually click this in the PRS system. I'll just go over a little bit about the written review in PRS. Now, if you open the PRS, it, you can go to the home button there, and you'll be able to see all your assignments. And each assignment has a proposal or application number. And it's a hyperlink. And if you click that hyperlink, you'll be able to see the full proposal open in PDF on a separate uh, screen. Once you uh, read the proposal and you, you write your review, you could copy and paste that review. And how do you do that? go into this uh, create or modify your review link, click that one, and it will open a separate dialog box and you'll be able to copy and paste your review. If you need any additional guidance, 
The PRS also gives you a review instruction, a manual, which actually uh, provide a very good details of how to conduct a review. Now, when you click this link, I'll show in the next slide, a dialog box will open up like this. So you can actually go and copy and paste and do a little bit of editing there. You would be able to see some uh, buttons available. And below there is a scope. Uh, you can actually grade them and give a score. Now, the important thing to note is the review is not complete. And as NIFA staff, we will not be able to see that unless you click continue and complete submission. There's a save for later button. And if you just press that, it's actually going to save the work for later and it is not completed. Now, some of your assignments, you would see you assigned as a reviewer, sorry, reader. And if you are a reader, you do not have to write a review. You just have to write, I am the reader in that box here and give a score of good. That's all uh, the readers are required to do. And all these assignments must be completed by November the 8th, uh, like 5, 5 p.m. Eastern. Sorry, not 5 p.m., actually 12, 12 midnight. So follow the published uh, evaluation criteria in the RFA to evaluate the uh, proposal and identify strengths and weaknesses. And your rating should be actually corresponding to these strengths and weaknesses you have described. For example, you uh, had a lot of strengths and very few weaknesses listed and you gave a fair or poor score that does not really correspond with each other. I will just go over a little bit about, uh, this is more or less a uh, subjective, but uh, will give you some guidance of how to uh, score them. This proposal score of excellent is a application with no major flaws. It had many, many strengths and the PD himself or the other group is well qualified. It is very relevant to the program uh, priority areas. The written uh, narrative is very clear, stating very clearly the objectives and everything feasibility studies are given and the preliminary data are shown. This looks like a very exciting innovative idea and it might have really greater impact to the institution or agriculture and the work plan is very realistic. So it has a lot of strengths and very few or no weaknesses. And that kind of proposal gets an excellent score. The proposal which has given a very good score may have no fatal flaws, but it may have some minor flaws, right? And it may uh, perhaps even and uh, one or two important flaws. So many more strengths, but there are a few weaknesses, right? Overall merit is generally good. PD and the personnel are qualified. It's also relevant to the program. The objectives are clear. It's a feasibility of the study is well demonstrated, but the preliminary data may be less supportive. So that kind of a proposal may get a very good score. A proposal which receives a good scoring is more, have, more or less having significant flaws. The strengths and weaknesses are more or less equal way. You could see that here. And the, the merit is somewhat less or the proposed idea is less innovative or it may even not have more impact in the future. Perhaps the personnel are not qualified to do the work or it even not fit into the program priority areas or maybe the proposal lacks the preliminary data to demonstrate feasibility. Then the score fair. This one is more heavyweight on the weaknesses and the very few strengths or less uh, strength there. Very marginal merit or not innovative at all. It's not a novel idea. It may not even have potential for impact. 
the personnel are not qualified or it doesn't even suit to the 1890 capacity building program. They did not include any preliminary data. It's poorly written, not well thought out, or there are a lot of pitfalls and they may not even address how they are going to uh, actually address some of these limitations. And then the last score is the poor. The poor score has many, many weaknesses and very few or no strengths at all. The weaknesses are markedly exceed the strength. No merit at all or very little merit and does not fit to the program. The PDs are not qualified and it's uh, there are some major conceptual errors or flaws. There are experimental designs which are wrong or the proposed idea is not correct. And it's also poorly written and communicated. I do hope that this gives you some sort of idea of this ranking, of, I mean, actually the scoring of these proposals, even though it may be uh, different from individual uh, applications when you read them, but hopefully this might guide you on how to uh, score them and based on your uh, written review, based on that score supporting that the strengths and the weaknesses. Now I've talked a little bit about the panel discussion guidelines. Now, once you submit all your reviews and we will hold panels, and I just want to give some uh, heads up here on the panel discussion, uh, panel process. We want to ensure impartiality in panel functions. It's very important to NIFA. So uh, just it is very important to mention that here in the uh, pre-panel orientation. Now the panel process is like multiple uh, steps involved. Now each of the proposals are now being assigned to three reviewers and a reader. You are conducting currently the individual reviews and you will submit that in the PRS. And once NIFA staff uh, complete our evaluation of those reviews, then we will hold the panel discussion. And once the panel discussion and deliberations are uh, completed, panel come to a consensus on the final rating and ranking of the proposal. And this is what we are, the NIFA staff will use in order to recommend or decline funding. So let's look at the panel discussion process. As a reviewer, you have multiple rows. So each proposal is assigned to three reviewers and one reader. In a very rare occasion, we may assign a proposal with an ad hoc reviewer. Primary uh, reviewer is also known as the scribe, provide a written review before the panel and summarize the discussion during the panel. Secondary reviewer provide a written review before the panel. Tertiary reviewer provide a written review before the panel. The reader or the ad hoc, if there is a one, only provide a written review only, only if we ask to do so. Otherwise, we, you do not have to do that. So during the panel process, the scribe or the primary reviewer will introduce the proposal and summarize the proposal and provide all the objectives, strengths, and weaknesses. The secondary reviewer will come in then, indicates the agreement or disagreement of the primary uh, description and can add any additional comments. The tertiary indicates agreement or disagreement and can add the additional more comments which are not mentioned by the primary and the secondary. As I mentioned before, the panelist for or the reader will act as a reader and he or she will only write that I am the reader in the review field and then they just give a good score, that's all. But once this, this uh, comments are provided, the discussion is open to all excluding the COI panel members to actually deliberate the discussion. And then the three reviewers determine the initial ranking. And the panel 
come to a consensus on this rank. After that, the scribe or the primary prepares a written summary, which is called the panel summary of the panel discussion to explain the final ranking and the recommendation. We are not going to tell them the exact number and uh, place of ranking, but it's like just saying that this is a very good proposal, you know, uh, recommend, you know, uh, not recommended, like uh, recommending of the positive aspects or negative aspects and any other uh, synthesis comments. Once the scribes submit that in PRS, the rest of the secondary and tertiary uh, panelists can approve and add any additional comments, edit this uh, before it's finally submitted. So it is very important, as I mentioned, we ensure the impartiality in panel functions. So please remain objective during proposal reviews. And panel discussions um, may sometimes give some very interesting discussions. Um, we ask you to be always remain objective, provide an opportunity for full discussion, and a create awareness of any potential biases in decision-making process. Always use a structure and criteria, such as like a strength and weaknesses in order to make the decision. And always, always refer to the RFA evaluation criteria as your guideline to evaluate the process. Make decision only based on the reliable information which was already appearing in the application. Do not make any assumptions. Make decision also based on diverse perspective. I just want to give you the panel dates. Uh, we have, as I mentioned before, two different panels. We have teaching education extension panel, which are planned to held in November 19th through 21st. And the research panel uh, is from December 9 to 30. Here are our contact details. You, uh, any program related issues, uh, please contact us. Um, any PRS or technical issues, uh, they, Wagner is very well versed with all that information. So our information is here. Anything with uh, your uh, panel related activities, Dr. Jacobson will be able to answer any of the financial information. David Sosa will be able to answer you. Please uh, note this uh, information. And I also want to take a moment to en uh, encourage you to engage with NIFA. And I thank you very much for serving on this panel. This is uh, really very important for us, NIFA, uh, uh, to secure your services and appreciate that. So you can also, meantime, explore other NIFA programs. You can reach out to agency staff uh, if you have any questions. And um, also you can subscribe to receive updates from NIFA. There's a NIFA newsletter coming in, which also uh, provide RFA calendar and webinar calendars. I just want to share our non-discrimination statement. USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer, funder, and lender. With that, uh, again, I take this opportunity to thank you for your willingness to serve uh, in this panel. I, uh, we really appreciate your time. It's a long time commitment. It's a very important, but also a very high volume program. And I will open it for any questions. Right. Um, first thing I put in the chat, there was a, a recent update to my phone number um, that was not updated on the slide. So I put it in the chat there for anyone to take note. Um, Rosanna, I will read off two of the questions I answered in chat. Um, somebody um, noted that the review instructions link uh, does not have any information in there. So I will get in there and make sure that uh, any pertinent information is provided in that review instructions link. Another question clarification was about the reader, which we did go over, um, that we will be asking you to click the good button 
no matter what your thoughts are on the review. And um, you can provide comments during discussion, uh, live discussion during panel. The written review will simply just say, I am the reader. And then, Rosanna, we do have an open question here about the deadline for the research panel. If you can see the Q&A box. Um, of course, uh, we did send the invitation about a week ago, and we provided six weeks for number eight uh, as like uh, the timing for you to conduct the review. But for any individual, only in a circumstance basis, if you are not able to complete that uh, November 8th deadline, please do reach us, reach out reach out to us and we will try to work with you. As the, there is, a, the, the reason is because of the, as I mentioned, we have 160 odd times three uh, reviews for NIFA staff to go over before we try to get ready for the panel. And uh, at the same time, I'm also understanding your, you know, commitment, you have a full-time job and you have other things. Uh, so if you have any uh, reason which you will not be able to complete your reviews on time, please do reach out uh, and let us know and we will try to work with you. And at this point, you can continue to ask questions in the Q&A box. You can also raise your hand if you'd like to, to come off mic um, and speak that way to you. All right, Jeff, I did see your hand raised. Was that intentional? So was, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so the other thing I was going to mention is, um, you know, you have the panelists have anywhere from 10 to 12, and there may be some flux in, in that based on some recent changes is point number one. Point number two is grab uh, a proposal that is, I'd say, really core to who you are, what you do, discipline-wise, function-wise, so you get comfortable with the, the uh, proposal format top to bottom in the review process and do that one first and then proceed in a methodical way through uh, all the assigned proposals in your four different capacities. The last point I would say is consider, strongly so, uh, coming back to that very first proposal or seeing as you get more familiar with the process, as you get better in, in your, uh, say, analytical review, of the content of the proposals and again, the format and the evaluation criteria, go back and look at those first ones you did because those were fresh uh, to the process. And you may be a different person as you progress through the process of your, you know, 10 ish proposals. So that's a suggestion. Uh, and I, I found it to be quite helpful uh, when I was sitting in, in the same seats that you are now as a, uh, uh, part of the peer review panel. And that applies for both the teaching extension one as well as the research one. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that, uh, sharing some of the insights. And of course, uh, you know, uh, sometimes the, your assignments, you may see a variety, it's a mixed basket. You may be a primary, secondary, tertiary, and a reader. So um, the primary is really a rigorous review had to have a lot of, you know, evaluation needed to be done. But if you are a reader, you read a little over the proposal, you are getting ready for yourself in case if you are needed to be contributing your discussions. So it might be like, uh, you know, this time of timing of uh, how you dedicate to, you know, evaluating individual proposals may slightly vary. Uh, there was a comment about getting the recording out to you all. Um, so it does need to get processed through our communications team and uploaded to a private uh, YouTube link. And then we will make it a priority to go through the closed captioning and make sure everything is accurate before saying it out. So we will get it as soon as possible. But in the meantime, Rosanna, we can send out the um, slides, right? Ahead yes, the slides are being cleared so they can be sent out. Uh, so only 
the recording has to be taken tight. Any uh, financial uh, aspects of the questions or any programmatic, uh, any, please raise your hand or I don't know, you have the capability to unmute and ask. No, need to raise your hand if you have any questions, if you'd like to come off mute. Otherwise, um, you can continue to ask questions in the Q&A. I have an anonymous question here about, uh, it seems somebody is does not have their assignments in PRS. They should be out there by now. Um, please contact me directly and we will work on your PRS account to make sure you have access. And I also want to remind at this point, uh, the invitation email sent out had an attachment of a conflict of interest form. Please do uh, sign that and scan it back to us, me and Dave Wagner, because we need this information as soon as possible. So uh, some of, or maybe a few of you have already sent it back. Appreciate if you can send it as soon as possible. I think it's well over seven minutes than we forecasted, uh, but I really want to thank you for participating today, taking time off from your busy schedule. And uh, do reach out to us, uh, any questions. Uh, Dave is very, uh, you know, well known. Uh, he is very, he's the expert in the programmatic area, like, you know, the uh, PRS related questions or anything you have technical issues. So do reach out to us or Jeff or uh, David Sosa, and hopefully we'll be able to see you soon in uh, the November panel and the December panel.